Okay, so yeah, to start over, we're gonna talk about writing maintainable infrastructure code. Um, so there's a lot that I'm gonna talk about and there's a lot that you can research afterwards, so I will give some resources at the end and post slides for everybody to see. Um, but let's start out with a scenario. Um, we have our boss who comes to us and he says that we need to write some, maintain or some new infrastructure, we need to set up some new servers to run an application. <laughs> this is all your fault now. <laughs> yeah, so, so our, our boss, yeah. So our boss says we have, to, we have to set up some new servers, we have to handle a new project that's going out, so we say we're gonna automate everything. We're gonna write chef cookbooks for this. It's gonna be great, it's all gonna be happy and unicorns. Um, and we do just that. We write our code, we get the servers stood up, we put it into Git, and we walk away. And then three months later, they say, well, we're gonna do a marketing push. We need some more scale. Um, so let's add some more capacity to the cluster. You run all of your cookbooks again, you set up you know, five new servers, and everything fails this time, and you don't really know why. Because uh, the problem is that we wrote the code as if we were just gonna run it once and totally ignore it. And so we let our ego take control, and we ended up with code that we don't even remember three months later what it did. Um, and we can't figure out what it's doing now because how can you know without expectations? Um, so we have to treat our code as if there's going to be a psychopath who's going to maintain it for us. Um, and even if you say that I'm always gonna be the maintainer, chances are you're not. Um, because Americans on average change jobs every four years according to a market watch survey. Um, technology is even faster than that. You know, when you look at people who have a two year ten tenure or a one year ten tenure in companies. Um, so how can we do this? Well, we can look at some real world examples. Um, and this looks really confusing, right? This is really hard to get through, but it's not. They took six roads and made an intersection and they marked it up so that you can get through from one street to the next with six roads coming in pretty easily when you really start driving through it. Um, and in our code, we can treat it the same way. We can have some, some code that on the surface looks really messy, but when you start looking at it, you realize it's doing something pretty simple and we can let developers know about that through our comments, through breaking our code down. Um, as we start commenting out code though, or as we start commenting up code, we may start commenting out code. Um, whether it's things change, whether we move code from here to another module, we might just comment it out. Which ends up being really bad because we end up stuck <laughs> in the middle of these code zombies where we're just fighting to keep the actual code alive and it's just surrounded by all this commented out stuff around it, and it's adding complexity to our programs. Um, it really becomes a matter of what's the point of version control if we're just gonna leave all of the code forever in the project. And luckily, we do have tools for this. We have ideas that developers have worked really hard to put together. Um, in the Chef world, for example, we have RuboCop, which is simply how do we write good, qu good code there. Um, Ansible has Ansible Lint and things like that. Um, so now that we're breaking down our code, we need to start testing it, right? We need to figure out how do we know if our code actually works? How do we know when things are broken? Um, and there's a lot of ways of testing. I know we talk a lot about testing in production and how do we figure out what's breaking when it's actually live. Um, and there's also testing you know, that we're always asking developers to test their code before they even give it to us. So why aren't we doing the same? Why aren't we testing our code, the infrastructure code, before we put it out into servers? Um, so as we start writing this code, we need to think about how do we cover it with tests? How do we make sure that it's gonna keep working? Um, and there's a lot of tooling, tooling around this as well. There's tools to cut to test, see what code is covered so that when things break, you can start to look at the code that's not covered. And if you tell me that you don't have time for it, then I'm gonna tell you you're wrong. Because you either have time to, to write the test now or you have time to fix your code later. Um, and I would much rather be able to see that code that I just wrote stopped Logstash from running then have to figure out why Logstash stopped running later on. Um, this is stuff that we can do on our laptops, in CI, in CD, for our infrastructure. <laughs> so we're now testing our code, we're now getting code out there, and the problem of having code that three months later I don't even know what, what it was doing or why it was doing certain things, we now have an understanding of that. Um, so again, my name is Dave Long. Um, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me online. Um, I'm a developer by trade coming into the DevOps realm. Um, I also am one of the co-founders of DevOps CT up in Connecticut, if you're ever up there. 
find us online. Um, and as I said, uh, there is some other stuff. You know, this was a lot of stuff to get into, and there's a fantastic book, Infrastructure as Code, that came out. Um, Bob Martin's Clean Code is always a fantastic read. And then there's stuff online that you can get into and just find more information.